Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching this edition of the Apocalypse Report. My name is Robert King. In the last edition, or first edition, I should say, I spoke about uh, the King of the North and the King of the South and the pushing that will take place during the time of the end. And I identified the British Empire as the King of the North and America and the Republican nation state system as the King of the South. I received a couple of emails from people saying they appreciated the presentation, but they had questions at how I arrived at uh, the United States of America being the King of the South. And that's a good question. I, I appreciate your interest. But again, just by way of review, in that span of verses in uh, the 11th chapter uh, of Daniel from uh, chapter 40 on, it mentions this pushing will take place during the time of the end. The Watchtower has identified uh, Germany, Kaiser's Germany, as the king of the north during World War I, and then, of course, it became Nazi Germany during World War II, and then when Nazi Germany was defeated, the king of the north became the USSR, and 20 years ago, nearly, um, the Soviet Union dissolved, and now we, we don't know who the king of the north is. But my position is that the king of the north has always been associated with the empire, the Roman Empire, which morphed into uh, the British Empire, and is still such today, uh, primarily by means of their global financial monetary system. And the king of the south is America. Well, if we look at ancient Egypt now, we can gain some appreciation of how it, it pictures America. As you know, the Israelites uh, ended up going down to Egypt during the time of Joseph. There, and there was a great famine, and the sons of Jacob and the whole clan went down to Egypt, and they, they were welcomed there. And in fact, they stayed there and actually became a very populous nation, at which point the Egyptians began to oppress them. But that's not the Egypt of prophecy. The prophecies, for example, in the book of Ezekiel, there's three chapters that deal with Egypt. That was long after uh, the, the Exodus and after Jehovah humbled mighty Pharaoh in Egypt. But Egypt, we might say, it was a benevolent empire. In fact, the Israelites looked to them for protection against Assyria and Babylon. And that's why Jehovah judged them, because of their lack of faith. But even though Egypt was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, it recovered and was still a nation at the time of Christ. And in fact, when Jesus was born, you recall when Herod uh, tried to have him put to death and had all the boys under two, year, two years of age murdered, Jehovah spoke to Joseph, Jesus' stepfather, and told him, take the boy and his mother down to Egypt and stay there until I tell you to come back. And that fulfilled the prophecy, out of Egypt, I called my son. Well, Jacob was his son originally. The Israelites were called out of Egypt with Moses, but so was Jesus Christ. So Egypt has always had an interesting relationship with God's people. It served as a protection for them. Well, if we go to the prophecy in Ezekiel, it's interesting. The, the wording here is... Uh, so expansive, it, it doesn't seem to really apply to e Egypt in the time of Ezekiel. But in the 31st chapter of Ezekiel, he, he likens Egypt to this gigantic cedar tree. And it was so huge that all the wild beasts of the field uh, perched on its boughs. And it says that, uh, verse 6, on its boughs all the flying creatures of the heavens made their nest, and under its branches all the wild beasts of the field gave birth, and in its shade all the populous nations would dwell. So Egypt, in a way, served that function in an ancient way. But today, the United States is viewed as the greatest nation that has ever existed. And that's what this prophecy goes on to say. It, it says, No other tr cedars were a match for it in the garden of God. As for juniper trees, they bore no resemblance to it. And it says, No other tree in the garden of God resembled it in its prettiness. So, it, 
I might explain why God refers to these trees as growing in the Garden of Eden. It has to do with the fact that after Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden, of course, all of mankind came under Satan's influence, but God also, he didn't uh, abdicate his own sovereignty. He, he made allowance for nations to come into existence for the benefit of, of people. True, they would not be adequate. They would not be totally satisfactory like the kingdom of God will be when it rules over mankind. But God has, well, as Paul said in the 13th chapter of Romans, the authorities stand placed in their relative positions by God. So it's like, that's why he refers to all the world as the Garden of Eden, because after Eden, Jehovah allowed these tree-like nations to grow up and to dominate. But this one nation, this Egyptian, this cedar-like tree, is grander than all the others and prettier, and all the nations live under its shadow. That is an apt description of America, the greatest nation that has ever existed. And like ancient Egypt, people has, have sought refuge in America. You know, after the Roman Empire dissolved, it, it really morphed into the Catholic Empire, which oversaw the feudalistic system. And all the kings and fiefdoms were really subject to the Pope. So that was an extenuation of the Roman Empire. And a, a financial empire developed around the city-states of Italy, Genoa, and but during the, the so-called Dark Ages, in fact, the Dark Ages came about because of, of a financial collapse of the House of Lombard. And, of course, the Black Death killed millions throughout Europe. In some places, half the population expired. And this really uh, brought an end to the feudalistic system and gave rise to the Renaissance. Because uh, people who had skills, craftsmen and so forth, uh, could command a better wage. And so serfdom was gradually phased out. It was the beginning of, uh, of what we would call the middle class. But the monarchies and oligarchies stayed in control. And it wasn't until the new world was discovered and people began to flock to the new world. And eventually, the colonies that were under England's control broke away and formed the United States. And ever since then, people have come to the United States, which have had nothing. You know, a few, some people had a few dollars to get on a, a boat, and that was it. But the United States offered them shade, you might say, from tyranny, and gave people an opportunity. Even those after the Civil War who... Uh, the slaves were set free, but they stayed under, of course, poverty-stricken and really didn't get civil rights until the 60s. But opportunities in the North opened up to them. So a son or a daughter or grandson or daughter of a slave could leave the South, go up to the North, get a job, say, in a car factory or a steel factory, and make a decent wage. They could buy their own homes. They could have a car. They could send their children to college. So... That's, that's what we're talking about here with this giant cedar tree. What is less understood and appreciated when we talk about this Anglo-American dual world power? I, I believe it's the king of the north, the empire, and the king of the south is America, the republic. And it's also symbolized in, in Daniel as the iron and the clay. The iron is the imperial fisted form of government, the clay being a symbol of mankind. Mankind is made from the clay. That's the Republican form. So these two forms of government are fused together in this Anglo-American dual world power. What is less appreciated is that America and Britain have been historic enemies, going back to the Declaration of Independence. The empire was not about to let its colonies go free, and a, a war was fought. Uh, the empire lost, but that wasn't the end of it, was it? Then came the War of 1812. The British Empire w was actually kidnapping American seamen and impressing them into service in the Royal Navy. 
And in fact, during the War of 1812, the British came on land and burned down the president's mansion, the White House. Well, after that, then came the American Civil War, and the empire was seeking a way to use that to the old uh, tried-and-true method, divide and conquer. They wanted to divide the United States, and so they supported the Confederacy because the, the cotton mills in Birmingham and Manchester were the primary beneficiaries of the cotton produced by the slaves. So, but when London threatened to blockade the ports of the North in an effort to aid the Confederacy, Tsar Nicholas of Russia told London that if they did that, then the Russian Navy would get involved on the side of Lincoln and the North, and the empire backed off. So after the Union was preserved, after the Civil War, the United States embarked on this great industrial expansion. Uh, the Transcontinental Railway was built, and all these amazing inventions. And uh, people from all over the world came to the United States, uh, the World's Fair in 1879, I believe, and uh, were inspired and were wanting to take back these innovations and the American system back to their country. And uh, among those were Japan, China, Russia, and Germany. And in fact, Germany started the, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, modeled after Lincoln's Transcontinental Railway. And Germany was intent on building a Berlin to Baghdad Railway. And this was viewed as a direct threat to the empire, because the empire, the London Empire, was dominated by their monopoly over seafaring trade. So overland routes would would put them out of business. And so they began working to em envelop the nations of Europe in a war. And after getting the nations sided up with all these various treaties, if you go to war, we'll support you and all this nonsense. Then they had the Archduke Ferdinand and his wife Sophie of Austria-Hungary assassinated while they were on an official visit to Sarajevo, which is now Yugoslavia. It's interesting, uh, the man that assassinated him was, uh, was a Mason. In fact, there were at least a half a dozen Masons that were recruited to assassinate this Archduke on that occasion. In fact, the, the procession way for his motorcade was lined with potential assassins. And the man that eventually shot him, that was his second go around. He, he at first threw a hand grenade, which bounced off the back of the carriage. It was an open carriage and exploded behind them. It's pretty lack security, I would say. But uh, so we, the Duke went on to give his presentation. He was visibly shaken, they said, but he got back in the motorcade and proceeded on. And the word got out that the assassination had failed. And then the man that threw the grenade came up and just shot him, as they said, in the carriage. It shot him and his wife. And, of course, that was the shot that set off World War I. A up until that time, the United States had no alliance with Great Britain. And, in fact, the United States, their policy was isolationism. Let the other nations take care of their business. We'll take care of ours. And, in fact, the, the Monroe Doctrine was uh, developed in the 1850s that told the European powers, stay out of the northern and southern hemisphere. It's not yours anymore. The colonial days are over. We'll stay out of your affairs. And a lot of the Americans during the time of World War I were uh, German immigrants. So their, their sympathies were not necessarily with, with Great Britain. But what happened was the ship called the Lusitania was carrying... Uh, passengers from New York to uh, Ireland, and uh, they let it slip out that you know the ship was carrying munitions to help the British in their efforts against Germany. And mysteriously, inexplicably, the Lusitania slowed down off the coast of Ireland in U-boat infested waters, and it was sunk. And 120 Americans happened to be on board that dr drowned. And so that, that swayed America to Britain's side. So this is part of the prophecy about the king of the north will scheme out schemes against him. And that's leading up to this great military conflict. 
which the Watchtower says was back in the third century between the Queen of Zenobia and <laughs> whoever. Uh, no, but there were 65 million men. That certainly is a great military force that fought in World War I. And of course, some 20 million lives were lost. But the empire accomplished its purpose. It knocked Germany to their knees. And then, of course, the war reparations really put them flat out. And Russia was taken out. It was on its way to becoming a great nation. And uh, they injected it with Bolshevism and and the United States as well suffered a setback, even though it was victorious. It was the, the year before the war, the United States allowed itself to be yoked with this Federal Reserve Bank, which is really a London scheme for controlling the finances of the United States. So this is this is this uneasy alliance between the iron and the clay. There's quite a bit of scheming involved. If after, after Lincoln won, uh, the Civil War and kept the Union intact, the Lords of London knew that there was no way that they could divide and conquer or confront America militarily. And they knew that their, their own empire was going to lapse into irrelevancy. So they started a number of secret societies, the Fabian Society and uh, another institution, not so secretive, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, still in existence today, called Chatham House. And they set up a sister organization in the United States called the Council on Foreign Relations. And so these two organizations were brought into being to bring America back under the imperialist thinking. So their, their intent was, okay, we can't destroy America, let's infiltrate, let's subvert, let's bring them under our control, let's use America as our dumb giant. We're the brains of the, the beast and they are our dumb giant, which is really the way things have been going. Again, the iron and the clay. They're antagonistic, but they're also yoked together in this unworkable union. So it's interesting when, when this, uh, this Egyptian cedar is going to be cut down by the tyrants of the nations. And the language the Bible uses uh, goes way beyond what happened in ancient Egypt when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Egypt. Sorry, <laughs> I just dropped my, uh, my hard drive. But anyway, um, for example, in uh, chapter 30, he says, how you people, alas for the day, for a day is near, yes, a day belonging to Jehovah is near, a day of clouds, an appointed time of nations it will prove to be. And it goes on to mention not only Egypt will fall, but her allies, Ethiopia, Put and Lud, which is Libya, and the land of the covenant, that would be Judah. So th these nations are mentioned there in the 11th chapter of Daniel. Not only is Egypt subjugated and the king of the north rules over her treasures, but the land of the decoration, Jehovah's spiritual land, is invaded, the land of the covenant. And it says here there, the foundations are torn down. That means that this greater Egypt, it, it will no longer be a, a constitutional republic. It will exist as a nation just as Egypt existed as a nation, but not, not in the form that we're familiar with it today. And along with her allies, Ethiopia and Libya. So apparently that will come to mean perhaps France and, and Britain. It's interesting that it compared all the, all the nations of the earth are as trees in this one giant tree. But in the judgment, all of the trees of the Garden of Eden go down. So this prophecy is foretelling the end of the nation-state system that, that began back with the Renaissance. And this modern Egypt emerged as this great shade tree. It's all going to go because we've reached that point of the time of the end where the empire, the whole, the whole Anglo system is going to go down. And that's also verified for us in, in the book of Revelation where the seventh head of the beast receives a mortal wound, but then it comes back to life. 
So this Anglo-American system is going to go down. It will shock and terrify the world, just as Jehovah was speaking in relation to Tyre and Egypt going down. All the kings of the earth will shudder in horror. And I should have highlighted the fact that um, verse or chapter 32, he uses the same language. He says, when you get extinguished, the, Egypt, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. And as for the sun with clouds, I shall cover it. And the moon itself will not let its light shine. And all the luminaries of light and the heavens I shall darken on your account. So this is the exact same apocalyptic terminology that Jesus used. Speaking of the tribulation, the sun will turn dark as sackcloth, the moon to blood, the stars of heaven. So that's the same language of Revelation, where the sixth seal is open. And didn't we just read that when Egypt goes down, this is a day belonging to Jehovah. Jehovah's day or the day of the Lord. Those are judgments reserved for the time of the end, the conclusion. So that's, that's what I've been trying to get across <laughs> for the last 10 years. And the book, of course, Jehovah himself has become king and other uh, essays on the eWatchman.com website. The Watchtower, of course, says that, you know, the wild beast of Revelation received this sword stroke back during World War I, which it really doesn't make any sense because they, they, they say that the Anglo-American... Uh, duo was the head of this beast, and yet they won. They were victorious in World War I. So what we're, what we're facing is the sudden collapse of the global financial system and the nation-state system with it. Oh, look, look what's happening. Next month, all the states in the United States, or not all of them, but most of the states, their fiscal year begins July 1. And by law, they are required to have a balanced budget. They can't print money like the federal government. And so some of these states are massively, massively in the red. Five billion, 12 billion. You know. And so what, what are they going to do? If they try to balance the budget by cutting you know, austerity, basically they will have to suspend all services. Just fire all your police, all your firemen, close all the schools. We're shutting down. So that's, that's what we've come to. The, the system, forget all the Bible prophecy. If, if the Bible was totally irrelevant, we're still at the end of a system of things. It just so happens, or not so happens, it, it is also the case that Jehovah foresaw this. And he recorded it as part of his word. And it is his judgment the day of Jehovah, that the nations be subjected to this final tyrant, the eighth king. And it will come as a humiliating shock for Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower especially, because they have touted themselves as the explainer of all things prophetic. And yet it will become apparent that they were blind. And the prophecies themselves actually address Jehovah's people as being blind. Who is as blind as the servant of Jehovah? Who is as deaf as the messenger whom I send? Hmm? Isaiah, Jehovah's Witnesses claim to be God's servants. Okay, then the prophecy speaking to you. Who is as blind as the servant of Jehovah? Well, I think that's going to do it for this second edition of the Apocalypse Report. If you have questions, give me your feedback on this. You can email me on the YouTube channel here, private message, or at watchmanspost at gmail.com or watchman at ejehoviswitness.com. I'm easy to get a hold of. There's an 800 number. You can call and leave a, a voicemail. Until the next time. Thank you.